Welcome, podcast friends. We have a fantastic episode for you today. Last year, we brought listeners the entire volume of the Best Investment Writing Volume 3 in audio format right here on the podcast. Listeners loved it, so we're running it back again this year for the Best Investment Writing Volume 4. You'll hear from some of the most respected money managers and investment researchers from all over the planet. Today's episode is brought to you by Mudwater. Mudwater is a coffee alternative with four medicinal mushrooms and Ayurvedic herbs with one-seventh the caffeine as a cup of coffee. You get energy without the anxiety, genders, or crash of coffee. Each ingredient was added for a purpose. Turmeric for inflammation, cinnamon to help suppress sugar cravings, cacao and chai for mood and energy, lion's mane for focus, cordyceps for physical performance, and chaga and rishi for immune system and stress. I've been drinking mud water for a couple of years now. It's a great balance to my normal coffee routine and also my go-to for when in the afternoon I need a pick-me-up without the jitters. Mud water is 100% USDA organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, Whole30, and kosher. As a special offer for listeners of the show, visit mudwater.com and use the code MEB for 10 bucks off any Mudwater's products. That's M-U-D-W-T-R dot com and use the code MEB for 10 bucks off. Enough from me. Let's get to our guests and let them take over this special episode. Hi, this is Alec Lucas. I work for Morningstar Manager Research Services, and I'm going to read a paper entitled A New Perspective on Geographical Diversification, Revenue Exposure by Region. It was first published in February 2019 and is a collaborative effort on the part of Morningstar Manager Research Analysts in the United States, Europe, and Australia. Domicile has long been an investor's only way of geographically diversifying a portfolio. In certain instances, this can give a misleading interpretation of the actual diversity of a portfolio. As the world has grown, so has the reach of large multinational companies. Now where a company is headquartered can have little bearing on where its underlying revenues come from. The tobacco company Philip Morris International, for example, has long been one of the largest stocks in the S&P 500 index without ever having any U.S. revenues. Similarly, the pharmaceuticals firm GlaxoSmithKline is a large fixture in Britain's FTSE 100 index, but gets minimal revenue from the United Kingdom. While it might seem obvious that prominent multinationals like Philip Morris and GlaxoSmithKline have global revenue streams, it isn't always clear where less well-known companies make money. Consider Millicom International Cellular. MSCI regards it as a Swedish business, whereas Morningstar assigns it a U.S. domicile. Neither domicile does justice to the economic drivers behind Millicom International Cellular's current business, however. It is focused on Latin America and Africa. As of fiscal 2017, Millicom International Cellular got more than 85% of its total revenue from Colombia, Paraguay, Bolivia, El Salvador, and Costa Rica, with most of the rest coming from Tanzania and Chad. Viewing such companies through the lens of revenue offers a significant advantage over domicile. Looking at revenue exposure by region alongside domicile highlights differences between these two approaches to geographical diversification. What stands out most is the importance of China and the United States to the global economy. Consider the MSCI All Country World Index's domicile and revenue-based exposures by region and country, respectively, as of September 2018. Each region's revenue exposure is within about three percentage points of its domicile-based weighting, except for Asia merging in the United States. Asia merging's 9.4 percentage point increase is driven largely by China, which has a 3.5% domicile-based weighting in the MSCI All Country World Index but a 10.6% revenue base weighting, a threefold increase. The United States relative importance by contrast decreases. At 41.9%, its revenue base weighting is 13.3 percentage points less than its domicile based weighting. Even if the United States relative stature diminishes in the shift to revenue from domicile, its absolute importance remains paramount. Comparing the United States, China, and Japan, the three biggest countries from the standpoint of revenue, the United States 41.9% share of the MSCI All Country World Index's revenue is nearly four times that of China's 10.6% 
and nearly six times that of Japan's 7.2%. Moreover, home country bias is especially pronounced for U.S. investors. Only Australia's S&P ASX 200 index rivals the United States S&P 500 index for the percentage of revenue it receives from its home country, 57.9% versus 62%. At the other end of the spectrum, France's Euronext Paris CAC 40 index garners just 17.5% of revenue from its home country. To put that figure in context, the MSCA All Country World X US index receives 16.8% of its revenue from the United States, even though that benchmark excludes US domiciled companies. US investors face the challenge of revenue based home country bias, even to some extent in the international portion of their portfolios, whereas European and perhaps most other investors, save Australians, face the challenge of rooting the domestic portion of their portfolios in the revenues generated from their home countries. Some investors, of course, would not see either condition as a problem. U.S. investors, for example, might wish to preserve home country bias within their portfolios because of the potential impact of tariffs, whereas French investors might be content with modest home country revenue exposure because they prefer the prospects of companies doing business elsewhere. Either way, one can decrease or increase home country revenue exposure by paying heed to market cap and style. Consider the revenue exposure by region for domestic benchmarks with differing market cap orientations for the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, and Australia. Each tells a similar story. As the average market cap increases, the percentage of revenue from one's home country decreases, and the percentage of revenue deriving from other regions generally increases, a pattern that is especially pronounced in the U.S. benchmarks exposures. Investors who want to magnify home country exposure should tilt their portfolios towards small caps. Conversely, investors seeking greater revenue diversity within their portfolios can tilt them toward mega cap stocks. Granted, with more than half of the S&P 100 index's revenue still deriving from the United States, tilting toward mega cap stocks won't remove revenue-based home country bias for U.S. investors. Attending to style, however, offers another lever that investors can pull. Consider a mapping of the growth and value versions of the Russell 1000, Russell Midcap, and Russell 2000 indexes to the nine grids of the Morningstar style box, including the percentage of each benchmark's U.S. revenue. The growth version of each index has a lower weighting to U.S. revenues than its value counterpart. And in general, the tilt away from the United States and toward other regions once again becomes more pronounced as one moves up the market cap ladder. So for example, the Russell 1000 growth index gets 59.6% of its revenues from the United States versus 79.7% of its revenues from the United States for the Russell 2000 growth index. By contrast, the Russell 2000 small cap index and the value version gets 82.8% of its revenues from the United States. So as you go down the market cap ladder and towards value, you get more exposure to your home country, in this case, the United States. Even for investors without access to Morningstar revenue by region data, these insights about market cap and style provide a number of ways to increase international revenue diversification within a portfolio. One is to build a portfolio oriented towards mega cap growth stocks as these companies have the business models and resources to pursue opportunities irrespective of geography. In contrast, another option is to build a diversified global portfolio oriented towards small cap value stocks because these companies tend to have businesses that receive most of their revenues from their home countries. Investors can also combine these two contrasting approaches. The third option results in a portfolio characterized by market cap, style, and geographic diversity, whether measured by domicile or revenue source. Investors mulling which option to choose should bear in mind the kind of businesses associated with mega cap growth stocks versus small cap value stocks. Consider the S&P 500's aggregated U.S. revenue exposure 
for each of the 24 global industry classification standards industry groups. Those industry groups with the lowest U.S. revenue percentage tend to have a heavier weighting in growth-oriented benchmarks and funds, while those with the highest U.S. revenue percentage tend to have a heavier weighting in value-oriented benchmarks and funds. The financial sector, for example, is often the biggest weighting in value indexes, and all three of its industry groups, banks, diversified financials, and insurance, receive between 70% and 85% of their revenue from the United States. These characteristics for home country revenue exposure generally hold for all the markets we examined. Yet at the individual company level, outliers exist. Per Morningstar data as of September 2018, Citigroup bucked the trend within banking by receiving less than half of its revenue from the United States and as much as a fifth from Japan. The semiconductor company Analog Devices received 39.1% of its revenue from the United States, nearly three times its industry group average. Even as drilling down to the individual company level provides insight into the revenue variation within industries, it also shows the data isn't as standardized as one might wish. Indeed, sometimes differences start with the definition of revenue itself. When comparing the fiscal 2017 annual reports of analog devices and Skywork solutions, one finds that these companies on the surface seem to differ dramatically in the percentage of revenue received from China, with analog devices garnering 17% and Skyworks 82.7%. Yet analog devices defined revenue in terms of the primary end customer location for its products, whereas Skyworks revenues did not necessarily correlate to end market demand by region. In fact, Skyworks even went to the trouble of highlighting that its China revenues included sales of products to a company that is not headquartered in China, but that manufactures its products in China for sale to consumers throughout the world. That company was almost certainly Apple, and had Skyworks defined its revenue in terms of end customer location, its China revenue would have dropped significantly. In fiscal 2018, Skyworks redefined its geographic-based revenue definition for that year and for the two previous ones, from country of destination to the site of the original equipment manufacturer's headquarters or end customer location. That cut Skyworks fiscal 2017 China revenues to 27.9% a nearly 55 percentage point drop from under the prior definition. To the extent that this change represents a trend toward data standardization, it is an encouraging sign. Yet the Skyworks example also highlights the potential challenges of assessing one company's revenue exposures, much less a portfolio of companies. It is therefore useful to take a step back and outline how Morningstar's new revenue exposure by region data point comes together. This lens for public companies is nearly comprehensive in scope. Morningstar's library of annual and semi-annual filings include stocks trading on major exchanges in North America, Europe, Australia, and New Zealand, as well as firms whose market capitalizations exceed USD 100 million. The resulting database covers the vast majority of the world's equity market capitalization. In content, though, the revenue exposure by region lens for portfolios is necessarily directional. That is because revenue disclosures vary from company to company in the regional classifications of their operating segments, and even within the same company, geographical based segments can be intermingled with functional segments spanning multiple geographies. For the operating segments of Apple, PepsiCo, and Coca-Cola, Consider Greater China as an example of how these companies' regional classifications differ. Apple reports separate revenue results for Greater China, composed of China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. PepsiCo includes Greater China in Asia, and within the same operating segment combines Asia's results with those from the Middle East and North Africa. Coca-Cola's Asia-Pacific region isn't as broad, but still groups greater China together with countries as disparate as Australia and India. Matters are more complicated still, 
as Coca-Cola's bottling investments business, which accounted for 29.8% of firm-wide revenue in fiscal 2017, reports the results of bottling operations regardless of the geographic location of the bottler, some of which are in China. Thankfully, not every company makes it so difficult to assess the geographical sources of its revenue. Nestle stands out in this regard. In fiscal 2017, it reported country-level sales for 16 of its principal markets, accounting for 73% of total firm-wide sales. Companies also sometimes disclose revenue figures for geographies independent of or in addition to their regional operating segment classifications. Coca-Cola, for instance, transcends its North America and other geographical-based operating segments by reporting net operating revenues from the United States alone and its international operations altogether. Morningstar's revenue exposure by region data uses country-specific numbers and company filings whenever available. The present state of financial disclosures, however, requires estimates often to standardize the geographical data. Morningstar generates these estimates by dissecting companies' regional classification to know their component countries and using gross domestic product figures to approximate the proportion of sales allotted to each. Those country estimates are then asset weighted for each security within a portfolio and rolled up to provide portfolio level revenue exposure calculations for 13 regions, comprising more than 240 constituent countries. Revenue exposure by region data provides an important perspective to incorporate in selecting strategies to build one's portfolio. Whether one seeks revenue diversity through mega cap growth funds or prefers a global small value approach. The revenue exposure by region lens can also help investors assess whether a fund is adhering to its mandate when domicile based measures call that into question. Considering both revenue source and domicile provides investors with a more complete picture of what they own. Companies' geographic sources of re revenues, though, matter most in the aftermath of surprising political or macroeconomic events. That is what a comparison between revenue-weighted benchmarks and their market cap-weighted counterparts suggests following the United States' November 2016 presidential election and following the United Kingdom's June 2016 vote to leave the European Union. These revenue-weighted benchmarks were constructed using the Morningstar US Large Mid and Morningstar UK Large Mid indexes. Constituents without any domestic revenue, such as Philip Morris International or Rand Gold Resources, were eliminated, and each stock was then weighted by multiplying its market cap float with its domestic revenue percentage. The resulting revenue-weighted benchmarks for both countries had substantially higher weightings in the financial sector and to a lesser extent in utilities and real estate. They differed, though, in where they were the lightest relative to their market cap-weighted counterparts with the U.S. bogey's tech weighting dropping the most and the U.K. index's materials weighting coming down the most. Each revenue-weighted benchmark behaved as one might have expected in response to a major domestic shock. The winning U.S. presidential candidate's nationalistic rhetoric contributed to many companies with predominantly U.S. revenues, especially financials, rallying in the election's immediate aftermath. Between November 8, 2016, the election day, and December 1, 2016, the revenue-weighted version of the Morningstar U.S. Large Mid-Index gained 4.3%, outperforming by 1.2 percentage points its market cap-weighted counterpart. Granted, not every industry group within, with high U.S. revenues fared well. Utilities and real estate companies lagged, likely in part because of concerns about rising interest rates. Yet during this period, small caps outperformed mid-caps, which outperformed large caps, and value beat growth exactly what one would expect given that home country bias increases in the move down the market cap ladder and toward value. Outperformance of U.S. revenue heavy stocks proved to be modest and short-lived, but the United Kingdom's June 23, 2016 vote to leave the European Union had a more dramatic and lasting impact. Fear concerning the negative economic consequences of this decision it was a major impetus in the subsequent underperformance of the revenue-weighted version of the Morningstar UK Large Mid Index. From the day after the Brexit vote through October 2018, when our data ends, the revenue-weighted benchmarks 2.8% cumulative gain in Great British Pounds 
trailed the Morningstar UK large bid index by a whopping 20.2 percentage points. The month of the Brexit vote, June 2016, stood out as during it, the revenue weighted index lost 9.5 percentage points more in Great British pounds than its market cap weighted counterpart. That's a huge difference between two indexes that despite their different weighting methodologies, share a 0.9 correlation, 98% similarity of holdings and less than 50% active share. In debuting its revenue exposure by region capability, Morningstar has given investors an important tool for gauging geographic exposures within their portfolios that may not be readily apparent from looking at domicile alone. A company's country of domicile will continue to be important, but domicile-based measures cannot capture the geographic diversity inherent in most companies' revenue streams, much less a portfolio of those companies. And in certain cases, domicile-based measures prove misleading. The revenue exposure by region lens offers a major step forward. Morningstar's revenue exposure by region capability and gives investors the ability to determine the global makeup of their equity portfolios. Those seeking revenue diversity in their portfolios can tilt towards strategies with diverse revenue mixes or add options to redress under exposure. Investors can also choose to tilt toward or away from a region or country for macroeconomic reasons, such as a debilitating trade war or Brexit-like scenario. In the end, use of this tool allows investors to be more aware of the geographical risks they are taking.